Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Praia de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. I want to start by pointing out the reason these films are being produced. It is not because I have any particular interest in personal tragedy type stories and all the emotions that go with them. It is because this case demonstrates how establishment organisations such as TV and media including the BBC, the government, the Prime Minister, the Cabinet Office and government agencies, British Intelligence and Scotland Yard are used nefariously for a range of purposes that most people are not aware of. It is the cancer within and the blatant corruption at play in these organisations that I am exposing in these films. It is my belief that these elements of the establishment are in criminal hands and the sooner this is exposed to a wider audience the better. In this film I intend to put under the microscope one of the most important aspects of the Madeleine McCann case and that is the question of what hard evidence there actually is of an abduction or more particularly what evidence we have that there was an abductor. There has been a bewildering variety of suspects, persons of interest and people we want to eliminate from our inquiries paraded before us over the years by various police forces and the McCann's own private investigators. Here is a collection of just 14 of them which the Daily Telegraph put together in 2009. In my previous documentaries I have looked in some detail at the McCann's account of what they said they saw and did after discovering they say Madeline's empty bed. I examined the contradictions, the changes of story and the physical evidence of what the police found or didn't find in the McCann's apartment. I quoted from the interim police report of Inspector Tavares de Almeida which he signed off on the 10th of September 2007 just a day after the McCann's returned to England having been made suspects in Madeline's disappearance. Speaking of the McCann's apartment, the inspector wrote, for example, there is strong evidence that the crime scene was altered and furniture was moved around. Those changes are indications that the abduction was a stage-managed hoax. As time went by, the abduction scenario was not confirmed. The abduction hypothesis did not stand up. His overall conclusions were devastating. Madeleine McCann died in apartment 5A at the Ocean Club Resort in Praia de Luz. A staged hoax of an abduction took place. The McCanns concocted the claim that the apartment was regularly checked while they slept. The McCanns concealed their daughter's corpse. From what has been established up to now, everything indicates that the McCanns, in self-defence, did not want to deliver up Madeleine's corpse. There is therefore a strong possibility that it was moved from the initial place where she died. We know from the Portuguese police reports, which were publicly disclosed on DVDs in July 2008, that there was no physical evidence of an abductor. No fingerprints, no DNA, nothing in the apartment that suggested an intruder. We saw in my previous film how the McCanns spoke to friends and family who then told the media that someone had jemmied open the shutters and broken them. This was then proven to be false within the first 24 hours. The McCanns later made the claim that the abductor, as he removed Madeline from the apartment, may have opened the curtains, window and shutter as a red herring. In order to sustain a claim that Madeline was abducted, evidence of an abductor is required. The McCanns got it from one of their close friends who was on holiday with them, Jane Tanner. She said she had seen an abductor the evening Madeline disappeared at about 9.15pm. And five and a half months later, the McCann team produced this image of him. What I intend to show in my film is that this so-called abductor, said to have been seen by Jane, was most likely bogus, a phantom. 
I will also reveal startling evidence about how her description appears to have been originated by examining the claims of a German resident, Nuno Lorenco de Jesus, who was on holiday with his Portuguese mother in Sagres, about 15 miles from Praia de Luz, where the McCanns were on holiday. He claims that days before Madeline was reported missing, he saw a man photographing children on Sagres Beach, who later tried to kidnap his daughter. I will call this man Sagres Man, and in a moment I will name him. Finally in my film, I will deal with the claims made on BBC's Crime Watch programme in 2013 by a former head of Scotland Yard's Madeleine McCann investigation, Detective Chief Inspector Andy Redwood, that he had now, after six years, found the man allegedly seen by Jane Tanner. He said it was a man who had been carrying his young daughter home from a night crash that evening. On top of that, DCI Redwood resurrected on Crime Watch a claimed sighting of an abducted by an Irish family, the Smiths, from Drogheda, claiming that this man was now the central focus of his investigation. I will examine Scotland Yard's claims in great detail. To be clear, what we have is four separate claims of an abductor. These I shall call Sagres Man, allegedly tried to kidnap a young girl from her parents on the Sunday before Madeline was reported missing. Tanner Man, a man carrying a young child allegedly seen by the McCann's friend Jane Tanner. Smith Man, a man carrying a young child allegedly seen by members of an Irish family. And finally, Crash Man, the man Scotland Yard say was the man really seen by Jane Tanner. Jane Tanner's description of a man carrying a child was the first in time to be reported. The police were told about it soon after they arrived, late in the evening on the 3rd of May 2007, the day Madeline was reported missing. Her sighting was reported to Jerry McCann and the other members of their group, known as the Tapas Seven, on two timelines scribbled down by Jane Tanner's partner, Dr. Russell O'Brien. They were written down on the ripped-off cover of Madeline's Sainsbury's Activity sticker book. These scribblings were allegedly done in a hurry that evening, or possibly before that evening. We don't know who ripped off the cover of Madeline's book, as no one has told us. Most likely, either Madeline's mother or father, Jerry or Kate McCann. A staggering five and a half months later, a sketch of this man was finally produced by a lady called Melissa Little, who the public were told was an FBI-trained forensic artist. If we look at the two timelines, we see on the first one the entry 920-5 stroke Ella crossed out, Jane checked 5D, sees stranger and child. 5D is the apartment of Russell and Jane. Then on the second line, this is changed slightly to 9.20pm, Jane Tanner sees stranger walking carrying a child. Later, the McCanns and Jane Tanner pinpointed the time of this alleged sighting to 9.15pm rather than 9.20pm. Jane Tanner told police in her first statement, dated the 4th of May 2007, that as she walked up the lane towards her holiday apartment and the McCann's holiday apartment, she saw a man carrying a child with a hurried walk, it being this detail, together with the fact that the child was dressed in pyjamas without being wrapped in a blanket, that caught her attention. She only managed to see him from the side with the child in his arms. She noticed the individual's presence exactly when she had just passed Jerry and Jez who were talking. I think you were standing like that and, Joe, and Jez was there with his pram pointing down that way. Because I think if you'd have been looking at me, because I, I would have said something, because I would have said about, because Kate had been moaning that you'd been gone a long time watching the football. I'm almost certain that when I came out, I came <laughs> over and he was here and I was like that. That's my memory of it, is like, Jez is 6'3 or something and looking up and then turning in when I finish. Mm. That's my memory of yeah. it. By 9.15pm it was already dark. There was limited street lighting in the area. According to Jane Tanner's own evidence, she saw the man with child crossing the lane ahead of her and could only have seen him sideways on for a maximum of four to five seconds. Yet. Asked to describe the man she saw, she was able to give all the following details to the Portuguese police the next day. Dark-skinned individual, male sex, aged between 35 to 40, slim physical appearance, about 1.7 metres, 5 foot 7 tall, very dark, thick hair, longer at the back, she could only see him from behind. He was wearing linen-type cloth trousers, beige to golden in colour, wearing a dark duffy-type jacket, but not that thick, his shoes were dark in colour, classic type, he had a hurried walk, 
he was carrying a child who was lying on both his arms in front of his chest. By the way he was dressed, he gave her the impression that he was not a tourist because he was very warmly dressed. Asked to describe the child, she said this. About the child whom appeared to be sleeping, she only saw her legs. The child appeared to be older than a baby. She was barefoot and was wearing what appeared to be cotton pyjamas of a light colour, possibly white or light pink. She is not certain, but has the impression a design on the pyjamas, possibly a floral pattern, but she's not certain. Her statement adds, as regard these details, she does not know what Madeline was wearing at the moment of her disappearance, because she did not talk to anyone about this. As to her concerns about the man she saw, she only spoke to Jerry about this, not entering into details, and to the police. Pausing there, how credible is it that her sighting appears on two timelines of the evening's events, written out that very evening by Russell O'Brien, yet she claims not to have informed anyone in the group except Jerry McCann, and then later the police. Jane Tanner was later to explain that she hadn't told Kate McCann about her sighting because, since Madeline was already missing, she didn't want to upset her any further. Again, how credible is that? Let's just recap. She says she saw someone carrying a child. When the McCanns reported Madeline missing, Jane Tanner told Jerry McCann about the sighting. Russell O'Brien wrote it down on the two timeline sheets on Madeline's sticker book. It must be perfectly obvious that a group of people worried sick about a missing child, one of whom had allegedly seen a man carrying a young girl clad only in pyjamas, would immediately have got together with Jane and fired question after question at her, such as, how old was the child? What was she wearing? What was the man wearing? What did he look like? Which way was he heading? Was anyone with him? Yet, according to the McCanns and Jane, this never happened. You would also expect the rest of the group to ask Jerry, Kate, what was Madeline wearing when she was taken? Yet, in Jane's statement, as we've just seen, she said, she, Jane, does not know what Madeline was wearing at the moment of her disappearance because she did not talk to anyone about this. But she does admit that she spoke to Jerry about her sighting. Again, how credible is it that Jerry didn't ask her exactly what the child was wearing, or that Jane didn't tell him everything that she claimed to have seen? A search for Madeline had begun sometime after half past ten, when the McCanns first reported Madeline's disappearance to the management of the Ocean Club and to the police. Villagers turned out to look for her. Some of them were searching all night. None of them seemed to have been aware that there had been a report by Jane of a man with a child walking away from near the McCann's apartment in a southeasterly direction, as she claimed. Had that information been given out, it might have helped the searchers to narrow the field of search. Six days later, on the 10th of May, Jane Tanner made a further statement to the police. In part of her statement, she elaborated further on her claimed sighting as follows. She can only affirm that the man that she saw carrying the child was in her belief associated with the disappearance of Madeline Beth McCann. Confronted with the information that the tracker dog teams had followed the scent trails in which, purportedly, Madeline Beth McCann had not passed the intersection where she indicated a man carried a child, she affirmed immediately that she was not lying, maintaining the honesty of her initial version that indeed there had passed in front of her a man carrying in his arms a barefoot child. At the time she had not paid him much attention, because it is common at the Ocean Club for children to pass in the arms of their parents between the creche and their respective homes, when they have collected them from babysitting service. Only it was strange that the child had no cover blanket, and the way the man walked rapidly, and how he was dressed. The trousers were slightly wide, their entire length being straight. They, the trousers, were as to colour identical to cortisite, a type of floor covering, chino style. As for the coat, it was dark coloured, seeming to be the same material as the trousers, it being a type of anorak. As for the footwear, she relates that she cannot confirm with certainty, but there were shoes which enabled the man to be fleet-footed. OK. So let's now look at how Jane Tanner has suddenly elaborated on her initial description of the man, adding all these extra details. The colour of his trousers was the same as cortisite. The style of his trousers was chino style. His coat was dark. His coat appeared to be of the same material as his trousers. The coat was a type of anorak. The shoes were of a type that enabled the man to be fleet-footed, whatever that means. How could she now remember these additional details? 
Could she really have deduced, only seeing the man for seconds, that his jacket or anorak was made out of the same material, that the trousers were chino style and the colour of cortisite? Remember, she only saw this man for five seconds at the most. And what is meant by shoes of a type that enabled the man to be fleet-footed? We now know that the Portuguese police were uncertain about Jane Tanner's evidence from day one, and that's why the public never knew about it for over three weeks. If we refer back for a moment to the extensive report of Inspector de Almeida, we can soon see why. Here are some extracts from his report. The child's parents immediately attributed her disappearance to the action of a third party, promoting the scenario that she had been abducted. The family publicised their claim that Madeleine had been abducted in a manner that had never been seen before. The very next day, British television stations led their broadcasts with the news of Madeleine's disappearance. The media presented the abduction as truth, although we were looking at other scenarios. As time went by, the abduction scenario was not confirmed. For instance, no ransom was ever demanded in exchange for information by the alleged kidnappers or for the child herself. Still, considering the evidence of Jane Tanner, we continued examining the possibility that Madeline had been abducted. She said she saw someone crossing the street in front of her. This information occupied us for a long time. This may be an example of how information that is not correct may not only delay the investigation, but could even have led to losing the little girl. Jane Tanner insisted her account was true, but there was a discrepancy about the moment Jane Tanner allegedly saw an abductor between the statements of Dr. Gerald McCann and Jane Tanner. They claimed to have passed each other only feet away, yet failed to see each other. Even the exact location where they supposedly crossed each other's paths is not very well defined by either. Also, the precise moment when Jane Tanner chose to make her statement about what she had seen and her explanation for choosing that moment is unreal. It is not easy to accept that any witness from the group on seeing someone with a child in their arms walking away from the McCann's apartment didn't act and speak immediately. Then there is her description of the abductor being altered or perfected. These reasons mean there is little credibility in what she says. Furthermore, Jane Tanner says that when she saw the man with the child, another man, Jeremy Wilkins, was talking to Jerry, but Wilkins doesn't remember seeing her either. Moreover, Jane says that she was on one side of the street, but Jerry says they were on the other. Yet another indication that Jane Tanner's story may have been a fabrication comes from Kate and Jerry McCann themselves. Jane Tanner says that when she saw the man carrying a child, she was about five metres away from him. But the same day Jane was saying that, the 4th of May, the McCanns were saying something very different. Kate McCann told the police, Jane, when she went to her apartment to see the children at around 9.15pm, saw from the back about 50 metres away on the perimeter road of the club a long-haired person in what she thinks were jeans with a child in his arms and walking very quickly but she is better able to tell you about that herself Jerry McCann said the same one of our group Jane at about 9.10 to 9.15 p.m. when she was going to her apartment to check on her children saw from the back about 50 metres away on the perimeter road bordering the club an individual carrying a child wearing pyjamas Jane will be able to clarify the situation. It looks as though someone had forgotten the script. Jane said 5 metres. The McCanns said 50. That's quite a difference. Also, if you look at the McCanns' two statements, notice the remarkable similarity in their wording. Jane went to her apartment, saw the man from the back, 50 metres, perimeter road, carrying a child, child wearing pyjamas. Jane can tell you more. So could this suggest people trying to remember a script? In October 2014, I managed to meet with a senior former member of the McCann's own UK-based Find Madeline investigation team. Now, very recently, somebody called Brenda Leyland, who had allegedly been sending messages on the internet about her opinions of the McCann's, um, was doorstepped by a Sky journalist and she then fled her home 
and then went to stay in a hotel and she was found shortly after that uh, dead. Now, I'm not sure what the cause of her death was. It said in the media that the death was not suspicious. How can it not be suspicious if she's fled her home under stress and then suddenly she's, she's found dead the following day? Now, the person that mainstream media should have doorstepped, I have come to try and speak to today. That is somebody called and I'm sitting outside the block of flats where he lives. Worked for the McCanns for six months, and in that six months, he had uh, an insight into the true investigation, quotes, investigation, uh, into allegedly trying to find Madeline. This man, who worked for the McCanns for six months, told me that he forensically examined all of Jane Tanner's statements as we have just done and he thought that none of what she said could have happened. The first the public knew anything about this sighting was on Saturday the 26th of May, over three weeks after Madeline was reported missing, when Jerry McCann summoned the world's media to a press conference. I could not find a video clip of this announcement online anywhere, so I will quote it for you. Jerry McCann stated, Good afternoon. We very much welcome the decision of the Portuguese authorities to release details of a man seen by a witness here in Praia de Luz on Thursday the 3rd of May, the night of Madeleine's disappearance. The release of this important information followed an earlier meeting that we had with senior Portuguese police officers, a meeting that Kate and I both found to be amicable and very constructive. We feel sure that this sighting of a man with what appeared to be a child in his arms, is both significant and relevant to Madeline's abduction, and we would appeal, once again, to anyone who may have seen him, or anything else suspicious, on or around the 3rd of May, to come forward and tell the police. For instance, was this man seen anywhere else in or near the town with a child, or what appeared to be a child? Which direction was he heading in? Did he have a vehicle? Whether you're a local resident or a holidaymaker who has since returned home from Portugal, any information, no matter how unimportant you may think it could be, may be vital in helping the Portuguese and British police to find our daughter. As we said yesterday, we wish for nothing more than to bring Madeline home with us safe and well. Kate and I would also like to make it clear that as this is very much an ongoing police investigation, we will not be making any further public statements for the time being. Thank you. The Portuguese police had by then already, at least in private, decided that Jane Tanner's so-called sighting was a fabrication. That is why they didn't want to release this description. There were several things, however, that the wider public did not know about this announcement. Firstly, it may well have been given out as the result of intervention by the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown. Three days later, on the 29th of May, the Telegraph reported that the police only released details of a possible suspect sighting in the Madeleine McCann abduction inquiry after her parents talked to Gordon Brown. While the Times added this, a spokesman for the McCann family confirmed that Gordon Brown had telephoned the McCanns, though the spokesman stated that the details of the conversation would remain private. He did confirm that during the conversations Mr Brown offered both Jerry and Kate his full support in their efforts to find Madeleine. Second, the public had no idea that it was a close, long-term friend of the McCanns, one of the Tapper Seven, who had come up with the description. Third, the public had no idea that Jane Tanner had already told Portuguese police, after an informal identity parade on the 13th of May, ten days after her alleged sighting, that she was sure that the person she claimed to have seen was in fact Robert Murat. Indeed, her positive identification of Murat triggered his being pulled in for questioning on the 15th of May and made a suspect. So the police already had a suspect based on Jane Tanner's story. Fourth, the public had no idea that every time Jane Tanner had been questioned by police, she added new details to her sighting, thus defying the well-known principle that memory fades with time. Jane Tanner's description of the man was released the same day by the Portuguese police. Notice that in Jerry's address to the world's media, he just refers to a man with what appeared to be a child in his arms, without referring to Tanner's evolving descriptions. Let's just look briefly now at the window of time given by the McCanns and their friends about when the abduction happened. Both Jerry McCann and Jane Tanner had been precise about their timings. 
Jerry said he left the apartment at 10 past 9. Jane says she saw him, Tanner Man, at 9.15 p.m. This left a window of less than five minutes during which the abductor would have had to accomplish the following. Pick an opportunity to enter the apartment immediately after he had seen Jerry McCann leave the apartment at 10 past 9. Walk through the open patio door without being seen. Find Madeline in the dark. Pick her up without waking her or the twins, without leaving any forensic trace on the bed or anywhere else. Open the window without leaving any fingerprints. Open the shutters from the inside with nobody hearing him do so and once again without leaving any fingerprints. Leave the apartment without being seen by anyone except allegedly for a few fleeting seconds by Jane Tanner at around 9.15pm. In addition to all this, the McCanns on many occasions raised the possibility that whilst he was in the children's bedroom, he also stopped to sedate all three children. It wasn't until the 25th of October 2007 that the McCann team got round to issuing a sketch of Jane Tanner's alleged abductor. That was a total of 25 weeks after Madeline had been reported missing. It was of a faceless man seen from the side. And of course, this man has never been found. Unless, that is, you believe what DCI Andy Redwood of Scotland Yard told 6.7 million viewers on BBC Crime Watch on the 14th of October 2013. I will come to that very important subject later on. But for now, with that background about Jane Tanner's claimed sighting out of the way, I can now consider another claimed sighting that week which was to assume major importance on the second day of the official police investigation. This was a sighting of a man I am calling Sagres Man. There is quite a bit about Sagres Man in Dr. Gonchalo Amaral's book, The Truth of the Lie. This sighting made a deep impression on him, as we'll see in a moment. Sagres, by the way, is a small coastal village about 15 miles west of Praia de Luz, where the McCanns were staying. It is on the extreme southwestern tip of Europe, exposed to strong winds much of the time. Its small beach would be very unlikely to have many holiday makers on it in April. So let's start with what Dr. Amaral says in his book about the Sagres incident. Information from Sagres tells us that an individual was caught in the act of taking photos of several children on the Moretta beach and in particular of a little girl aged four, blonde with blue eyes, who looks like Madeline. It was the little girl's father who noticed him. This 40-year-old man wearing glasses tells the investigators that the photographer tried to kidnap his daughter in the afternoon on April the 26th in Sagres. He allegedly then fled in a hired car with a woman in the passenger seat. The stranger did not look like a tourist. Brown hair down to his collar, wearing cream-coloured trousers and jacket, and shoes of classic style. This report reminds us of the individual encountered by Jane Tanner in the streets of Villa de Luz on the evening of Madeline's disappearance. We circulate a photo, which we obtained thanks to a surveillance camera in a Lisbon shopping mall amongst holidaymakers, clients and employees of Praia de Luz restaurants. Fruitlessly, nobody saw them. On the other hand, employees of the restaurant they usually went to in the Burgau Budens area remember them. Fortunately, no one else has yet occupied the apartment the couple stayed in. It's low season. We go ahead with a thorough search, looking for evidence of a child's presence. Shoe prints, fingerprints or footprints, nothing. We then gather various hair samples, doubtless coming from adults, and notice drops of blood on a kitchen unit. Nothing conclusive, it's probably from an everyday domestic accident. First, I note that Gonchalo Amaral gives a very specific date of this incident, Thursday the 26th of April. That's very strange, because as we shall see in a moment, the witness to this alleged child snatching, Nuno Manuel Lorenco de Jesus, I'll refer to him as just Nuno Lorenco, states in his evidence specifically that the alleged incident happened on Sunday the 29th of April. There is no obvious explanation for this discrepancy of three days. Amaral's book places the incident on Thursday. Nuno Lorenco says Sunday. I refer to this as the alleged incident because, as we shall see in a moment, there are real doubts about whether the incident as reported, or rather two separate incidents, actually happened. 